You're listening to the Monday Market Highlights brought to you by Milford. Good morning. It's Monday the 21st of February and I'm Roland from Milford. The key economic focus is most certainly on the geopolitical tensions in Eastern Europe as the world continues to speculate on Putin's plans with Ukraine. Now, there are many layers to this issue and there are a number of potential human and economic consequences should this escalate. The most obvious economic impact will be felt in energy markets and you're seeing increasing volatility in commodities such as oil. Now, crude oil futures were flat last week. However, they're up over 21% over the past three months. Turning to the US, the Federal Open Market Committee minutes were released last week, and the general interpretation was that they were more dovish than anticipated, given they didn't specifically state when they planned to introduce quantitative tightening, nor whether they would do a 50-bit rate hike straight off the bat. It is important to remember, however, that these were the minutes from a meeting they had at the end of January, prior to the significant inflation print we saw earlier this month. U.S. retail sales data was released for the month of January and beat expectations, increasing 3.8% month-on-month versus 2% expected. Internet retailers saw the strongest monthly growth, increasing 14.5%, followed by department stores up 9% and furniture retailers up 7%. U.S. PPI data was also released last week, increasing 1% month-on-month in January. Remember, the PPI measures the average movement in selling prices from domestic production. Core PPI, which focuses on the change in prices of finished goods, excluding food and energy, also increased 0.8% month on month. Now, PPI and CPI are highly correlated, so it's generally a good indicator of inflationary pressures in an economy. Turning to domestic news, it was quite light as it relates to official economic data, with the key release being the Aussie employment numbers for January. Employment grew 13,000 month on month, with the unemployment rate holding firm at 4.2%, both of which were roughly in line with market estimates. In New Zealand, house prices fell for the second month in a row in January, declining 1.5% month-on-month across the country. Auckland house prices fell 2.6%, which was a slight acceleration, and Queenstown reversed quite sharply, going from positive 4.8% in December to negative 3.9% in January. Also in New Zealand, Omicron has well and truly taken hold, with the country recording over 1,000 cases a day quite consistently. Turning to equity news, Reporting season in Australia and New Zealand continues to ramp up, and looking at the ASX 200 specifically, 37% of companies have reported their results month to date. Now, 48% of these have beaten expectations, with 27% disappointing, the balance of which was obviously just in line. In terms of price performance, financials x property, energy and materials are rallying the most on the day of their results, with IT being the worst performing sector. Now, this is despite the biggest positive earnings revisions occurring for IT stocks, so Australian technology companies are most certainly caught up in the global technology D-rate. Telstra, CSL, BHP, and Goodman Group all reported last week, with all four actually beating consensus expectations. There was some confusion around the Telstra result and how it compared to consensus, but what was clear was the very strong performance from their mobile segment, where EBITDA grew 25% year-on-year. Now, there are too many companies to touch on, but what has been clear is that cost pressures are really impacting most sectors, particularly for those businesses who have most of their workforce in Australia. Crown also finally agreed to enter an implementation deed with Blackstone, with the board unanimously recommending the $13.10 per share takeover price. Now, this is by no means a done deal, as they still require a number of approvals. Finally, Kathy Wood's closely followed ARC Innovation ETF continues to struggle, falling 5% on Friday, taking February losses to 14% and year-to-date losses to 31.5%. This fund has generally been considered a bit of a proxy for high-flying technology stocks with little valuation support and is now 58% off its 12-month highs. Looking to the week ahead, we will continue to monitor the situation in Eastern Europe given its potential implications for both equity markets and general global political stability. An important meeting to look for this week is that between Antony Blinken, the US Secretary of State, and Sergei Lavrov, the Russian Foreign Minister, as the US continues to try to find a diplomatic solution to the tensions. In terms of specific economic data, it's quite a busy week. In the US, the Personal Consumption Index will be released on Saturday morning, with the market expecting a 0.5% month-on-month increase in the core data series, taking the annual change to 5.1%. Now, the PCE is one of the two key measures of consumer inflation in the US, with the CPI being the other. There are a number of differences between the two, however, they generally move together, and it is actually the preferred measure of inflation by the Federal Bank. 
In Australia, we have the release of the quarterly wage price index on Wednesday, with economists expecting a 2.4% annual increase in wages, a slight acceleration on the 2.2% experienced in the September quarter. In New Zealand, the RBNZ press conference will be held on Wednesday, where New Zealand's central bank will announce their decision on the official interest rate, which currently sits at 0.75%. The market is expecting them to hike interest rates once again this week, and in fact, Economists expect the RBNZ to raise rates at every meeting this year, with the OCR expecting to reach 2.5% by year-end. Finally, we will continue to work through what will be a wave of results this week, and it will be very interesting to see how companies are navigating the current tricky operating environment. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next week.